So hello, everyone. My name is Patty Phillips. I'm the academic dean at Moore College of Art and Design. Thank you all for being here tonight. And I think we're going to have a really remarkable program. In the past few years, as many of you probably know, and with the leadership and stewardship of graduate program director Daniel Tucker and Moore graduate students, Moore College of Art and Design is, is establishing itself as a small scale, pint-sized, yet intensely vibrant space for important, generative, and often urgent conversations about the expanding roles and agency of artists and designers, as well as points of intersection with and within other fields on issues of contemporary life, culture, cities, and communities. I'm particularly excited about this evening's topic and our presenters here this evening. Um, eight years ago, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island. I was a new dean of graduate studies at Rhode Island School of Design. And I arrived to find uh, the college in the early stages of an ambitious and often deeply anguished <laughs> strategic planning process. RISD's new president, John Maeda, had set up working groups of faculty, and staff, and students. I co-chaired, for example, with one of our great museum educators, Sarah Gantz, the public engagement hub. But one of the working groups that really led to a lot of puzzlement um, was John's proposal of a health and wellness working group. What did this have to do with academic excellence or student and faculty experiences and some of the other institutional positioning and some of the other hallmarks of most, most college strategic plans? At the time, 2009, few people had any idea what a dynamic space of research and inquiry this would become for so many of us, including myself. I really think of some of the things that happened at RISD and then with our partner Brown University around this, this area of health and healthcare and wellness were just early forms of reconnaissance, information gathering, um, testing one's capacity and, and interests. Um, one of the things we did to get this launched was we had a two-day symposium called Make It Better that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Pioneer Fund. It included speakers such as Mel Chin, Donna Garland from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Claire Pentecost from Chicago, Damon Rich that Daniel was talking about a few moments ago, and others. And for me, it served as a catalyst for much of the work that I would find myself developing and um, sharing with graduate students at RISD and again with our neighbor, Brown University. A few other highlights over the years included a RISD Brown course called Communicating Medical Risk that was led by a uh, eminent oncologist named Fred Schiffman. And then it was co-taught by my good friend and Brown colleague, Richard Fishman from the art department and, and, and myself. Um, I was very marginally involved in a wonderful um, suite of actually now required courses conceived at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum of Art for Brown pre-medical and medical students that doesn't just deal with questions about empathy or close looking and observation, but actually questions future clinicians and doctors about how they think which is really increasingly important, it seems to me, in, in the increasingly kind of complex environment of, of medical research and practice. And then I was very involved in a symposium called Place Matters, Designed for Population Health, that I worked with, um, with Dean Terry Fox Weddle, who is the, is the dean of Brown University School of Public Health, looking at how you can design cities, neighborhoods, communities to uh, support and advance health um, and improve all the factors beyond biology and personal background that, that affect health. I also worked very closely with Peter Snyder, who is a really uh, well-known neuroscientist and a, uh, led the research initiatives of Lifespan, which is the hospital system in the Providence area, and his work around Alzheimer's, an exhibition that was actually at Brown called Memory, Mind, and Alzheimer's Disease that really looked at the devastating impact of this illness. Um, I mean, not only on the people who suffer from it, from, but from their families who end up being often very, very prolonged caregivers, communities, and of course, national he health care. Um, I still 
I continue to be challenged and inspired by these rich collaborations and also think a lot about expertise in this kind of, that, that is something very f flexible and dynamic in these kind of um, intersections between fields and disciplines, how expertise sometimes maybe needs to be asserted and maybe other times it needs to be deferred or delayed or withheld as we all learn about each other's work and commitments together. I think that these initiatives and forums um, that I was part of um, in the really protected enclave of academia in some ways maybe helped prime the pump, but um, there's so much extraordinary work going on you know, well beyond the kinds of things that I just cited very briefly. And I think we're gonna see a good bit of that work this evening, work that is bold and courageous, collaborative, passionate, and imaginative that we will learn about and think about together. Think about together. Think about how we think about this work tonight with our three remarkable presenters and our wonderfully accomplished moderator. Um, also, I hope that you'll be sort of gathering and collecting your own questions and impressions um, as they emerge during this evening. But um, our, our moderator, um, Megan Voller, uh, proposed that we maybe keep a few thoughts in mind as we listen to the, uh, our three presenters. Um, developing audiences, whether they're users, participants, readers, students, what are some of your strategies for engaging people in the work that you do? Um, we even just talked a few minutes ago about like pathways, what led our presenters into the work that they do. Also, working with healthcare community and health professionals, are they allies? Are they adversaries? Are they foils for our, our work? And then um, perhaps the big picture context, um, maybe a certain kind of blindness about healthcare um, and its relationship to a more holistic idea of human experience, that there are all kinds of determinants about health that have to do with with, with, with you know, economics and location and transportation and, and many of the other kinds of almost you know, community and urban factors that inter, uh, influence health. So again, maybe you know, think, keep those in mind and also think about your own questions as we go forward this evening. So I thank you all tonight for your presence um, and your interest and your engagement in this evening's topic. And I really anticipate a very spirited and very vital conversation. And of course, special thanks to our presenters whose bios are in the program. So I hope you've had a chance to read them for their strong commitments to this work and their participation here tonight. And they include Aaron Levy, Terry Kepsalis, and Rob Peeper. Thank you all for being here again. So our, I'm going to invite our first presenter, Aaron Levy, to come up and join me. And Aaron, Thank you, Daniel, for the invitation. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for, um, for this opportunity. So I um, began uh, about 20 years ago as an artist and a poet um, and uh, transitioned subsequently into education, into curation. And uh, over the last, uh, last years of, of work as an educator and as, and a, and as a curator, um, I've really come to focus on what I would consider the politics of care and the politics and practices of listening. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanna speak about tonight. But I, but I wanna begin by just saying that I think that like the recent events that have been happening across this country, um, post Charlottesville, but also in Flint and Ferguson, really in, 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 in every part of our country, highlights the absolute, absolute urgency of, of the conversation that we're having tonight. So I, I thank you for um, creating this forum. Uh, um, you know, throughout these the, the events that I've just kind of mentioned, um, I've turned to a colleague in in, um, in Detroit, Michael Stone Richards, um, to really to guide my thinking, to kind of help me make sense of of, of what's at stake. And um, as you can see here, he so eloquently kind of encapsulated, I think, the central challenge that we that we all face, which is that um, we're living through this kind of time when social compacts. Um, social structures, the structures that should be kind of protecting us are 
being incredibly eroded and actively eroded. And we need to develop new infrastructures of care. Um, and, you know, in many respects, because we're in like a college of art and design, I wanted to begin with kind of an earthwork from the 1960s that's been really influential to me. So there's a work, Annual Rings by Dennis Oppenheim. And, um, you know, what's interesting about this work is that it emerges at this moment of incipient environmental awareness in the 1960s when artists were uh, becoming very attentive to uh, our interconnectedness to each other, but also to environmental systems. Um, the 60s, as you know, is this deeply kind of um, both traumatic um, historical period, but also a period of extraordinary opportunity and um, seemingly limitless opportunity for artists. Um, um, there is this kind of, again, a sense of um, uh, our profound vulnerability facing social systems, but also our um, incredible connectedness to, to others, both human and non-human. And, and this kind of, that, that sensibility, that again, incipient environmental awareness and ecological kind of mindset has been really impactful to me and really was the inspiration for starting SLOT, which is a nonprofit that hopefully um, you guys um, 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 can spend some time with in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're up at 40th Street, and uh, 15 years ago we developed kind of the organization as really as a network of relations. Uh, a, a group of individuals came together that shared values, and projects have emerged out of that uh, shared sense of commitment. Um, over the last few months, um, the last few years, uh, I just want to map a couple of the different kinds of projects that we've that we've that we've undertaken because they maybe speak to again this um, desire to create kind of a conversation about community health and well-being, but not just isolating, let's say, the individual, the artist, from their society, but really um, placing them in a, in a in a greater social context. So Devin Allen, an extraordinary photographer from Baltimore, um, um, really enabled a sister cities conversation for. Um, uh, over across a number of events um, that really foregrounded kind of the events around the uprising in Baltimore, the exhibition that he developed for SLOT focused on Fred, Freddie Gray's neighborhood. So that was a conversation that really looked at state violence and how it impacts um, uh, life across race and across class in Baltimore. Um, this was a, a, a recent small project that um, returned to kind of early moments of environmental activism here in Philly and across the country. Um, Bill Ravanesi's work um, here shown. There's a, actually a photograph from uh, City Hall from 1986, uh, kind of a, a protester against environmental toxicity in the city. Um, work with young adults, uh, kind of urban ecology, urban ethnography projects that seek to like map out um, kind of an understanding of everyday life in the city, but also to recover um, resilient stories uh, um, from an older generation um, here pictured. Um, and then an another project that maybe crosses um, um, geographies, uh, a recent project with Abu Nadara Syrian Collective that looked at everyday life in Syria and the ways that artists were trying to contest media representation. So, um, so these hopefully give you kind of a sense of the variety of ways that, that at SLOT at least, we're trying to bring different individuals, institutions, and communities together to really reflect on um, what health and well-being um, can mean, but also about, again, the overarching like, power of social structures and systems right now on our, on our lives. You know, all of these conversations have really like kind of formed the organization. The organization is in many respects kind of a, um, a, an, an institution in, in, in process, um, constantly seeking to respond to lived realities and to social and political developments. Um, but I'm not here tonight to talk about SLOT. Um, I just wanted to kind of set that up um, as a way to kind of um, narrate the work that I'm, that I'm doing now with, with Health Ecologies Lab. But, but between SLOT and Health Ecologies Lab, um, a child emerged in my life, Emerson, um, named after Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and I bring this up because Daniel was hoping that we could talk not just about the work, but also how we come to the work and, and how our lives have changed, uh, both in relation to the work, how the work that we do has changed us, but also how other events have led us in the directions that we've taken. So two years ago, I became a dad for the first time. In two and a half weeks, I'll become a, a dad again. Um, and, um, you know, Emerson has, like, taught me everything. She's taught me how to to live, she's taught me how to love, she's taught me how to care in a new way, but she's also taught me how to care for, for, for myself and for others. And, um, and, um, and so in a way, like the work that I've 
been seeking to do collaboratively with others um, around this health ecologies lab, um, you know, really emerges out of out of um, my relationship to my daughter and my kind of ex, you know extraordinary like concern about um, her exposure right? uh, to the toxicity that surrounds all of us that that um, that we live and that we breathe in this city and across the United States and across the world, and so again that 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 incredible resilience and love that she has, but also that um, incredible vulnerability that she has um, is, is, is very much on my mind. So a year ago, um, together with kind of social policy and practice um, and Dean Jackson's work at Penn and, and also a new center for digital health that my wife um, has started at Penn Medicine, um, and also through the work at SLOT, we kind of, uh, kind of developed this thing that we call Health Ecologies Lab. Um, there's all sorts of individuals that have been part of it. This list is like not complete. Uh, Lee Sumter is in the room. Um, uh, Ami Yars is in the room. There's a, a few people that have been part of it that are here. But I guess what I wanted to just signal here was um, that you know the individuals that comprise the group uh, span different disciplines. Some are MD, PhD students. Some are uh, faculty. Some come from the humanities. Some come from um, medicine, but we all come together around this like profound concern again about uh, the role that social systems and in particular um, racism and, and um, gender-based violence uh, um, have over, over, over life and over the lives of many in this city and in others. Um, throughout this work, the work of um, the writings of Hual Biel, this exquisite kind of medical anthropologist at Princeton um, has guided us. Uh, I'll, I want to just briefly invoke kind of one book of his. I'll, I'll speak about it uh, in a little bit more fully. Um, but it's a book about Katerina, uh, a, a woman who lives in a kind of a rural area of Brazil um, and um, who has been like silenced in so many ways. And as an anthropologist, he um, really like supports her development of her voice um, despite all of the kind of um, power structures that she's kind of um, embedded within. And so in the introduction to that book, he kind of, um, um, he, he argues that we need to like, in a way, develop a, again a new capacity to listen to people, to understand them, to hear their stories, um, and not necessarily as diagnosticians, not in a clinical way, but, but rather in an artistic way, right, as readers and as writers. Um, so I think this is like something that we need to really hold on to, this kind of insight. Um, so the work at the lab is broadly structured around um, these three kind of questions. Uh, what can medicine and its understanding of health learn from social policy and the humanities? Right? So how can we, in other words, expand our understanding of health beyond the biomedical? Right? Um, two, how can we carve out spaces for conversations around social justice, for social justice work? Um, across disciplines, across institutions, and across geographies. Uh, as many of you probably know, those of you that are situated within institutions, large or small, um, but particularly those that are larger and particularly those that are academic, um, it's incredibly difficult to talk about social justice in a sustained way. Um, and then three, how can we develop um, knowledge making around health as a political practice? Right? Um, and how can we contest those that seek to control the discourse about knowledge? If we were to radicalize, let's say, these questions, um, they would lead us in this direction. One, how can we relate health to a revolutionary politics? Two, how can we develop new forms, new modes of caring that, again, exceed the biomedically defined conceptions? And then three, how can we contest the normalization of inequalities and suffering? Um, in anthropology, uh, Philippe Bourgoin and others have talked about how we need to denaturalize inequality, um, how we need to um, name it and contest it. Um, so I know that I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to really speak quickly. So I already had mentioned um, Hual Biel's work um, on our website that's kind of just relaunched yesterday. You can um, um, browse all of the kind of the work that we've been doing. We've really, at its core, developed the lab in its first year as a learning architecture. So there's all kinds of informal learning opportunities, uh, reading groups in particular, that I hope you'll join us for uh, across the city. So Hual Biel's work played this incredibly crucial role, again, um, um, uh, with Katerina, he provided her with the notebooks to allow her, despite her effective incarceration in medicalized settings, to write her narrative. He helps her reunite with her estranged family. He ultimately uh, buries her. 
Um, so it's a kind of a really committed model of um, um, scholarship and activism that um, is kind of evident here. Foucault's like pivotal work um, has also guided us his insights into biopolitics and the role that governmentality, but also corporations and technologies today play in um, really determining matters of life and death and controlling the most intimate aspects of our life. Um, something that I'm sure you're all familiar with from the legislative debates these days about um, women's rights, women's health, and so many other topics in this country. Um, um, just to very quickly bring this to a close, so there's a reading group at Jefferson that begins on Monday um, and I hope that you will, again, find like an invitation to join us in, in these remarks. Um, every week we will come together at 12 o'clock on Jefferson's campus. Um, this is an open group of students, scholars, community members, and others, really like, a totally um, open invitation to join us. And we'll be spending the semester reading individual chapters from a book against health, which uh, basically problematizes health and reveals how health is often a code word for racism and for other forms of uh, structural inequality. Um, at SLOT and together with the School of Social Policy, we'll have a reading group that meets this year on Thursdays at 10.30. Um, the readings will shift considerably, um, but will focus in a similar way on um, kind of critical um, and activist readings that contest um, kind of... Um, um, the, the ways that we're typically uh, habituated and socialized to think about health. Um, so to conclude, I just wanted to throw out this image, which is an image from uh, Sarajevo, where I've spent a lot of time working in and working on projects with artists and small institutions across the former Yugoslav region. Um, so this is from a couple of years ago, about uh, four years ago. Um, this was a, a state museum um, that at that time had closed. Uh, or had been closed, um, as, as you know from living in the United States, but, but as is incredibly pronounced in that region, um, like neoliberalism and um, kind of the rise of the return of fascism in that region has been incredibly pernicious for cultural communities, but also for all communities um, that are committed to like progressive futures. And, um, you know, I, I think this is a really complicated time in the United States. And I think because we're in a college of art and design, even though we're talking about health tonight, I also want to hold on to the discussion of the arts. And, um, you know, I think this is like an incredibly difficult moment in the United States for artists, for, for everybody, but, but in particular, um, um, at least in the way that I think, kind of running an institution for, for cultural institutions. And I think that we'll see in the years ahead a lot of closure on the part of cultural institutions. I think like for those of you that are students and artists in the room, like the work that you're doing like matters more than ever before. Um, and despite all that's going on all around us in the news every day, um, I think it's really important to hold on to the power of the arts to really transform how we think about community and collectivity, belonging, but also our relationship to self and to other. Um, so whatever, however you define your practice, I kind of want to argue that you do not just go underground with that work, but that you work across institutions, across disciplines, um, that you work with a truly expansive conception of what an artist um, or designer can be in society. And so I wanted to really just end on that note, that really to encourage you to embrace an expansive conception of practice. Um, again, one that maybe begins in the classroom, begins in the studio, but ultimately um, really transforms the institutions and the communities that you're part of. So I hope that you'll visit the website. We'll obviously be all talking more tonight, but um, when, uh, throughout the website you'll find readings uh, that really map out a new curriculum, a new way of thinking about what we're calling health ecologies. And if you type in the password care, um, you can download those and continue the conversation with us. So thank you. Next, we'll have Terry Capsalis visiting us from Chicago. You can read all the speakers' bios in your syllabus. Okay. Um, wonderful. Thanks. And uh, that expansive conception of practice, I, I couldn't agree more. And if I wish I were in Philadelphia now, because that reading group sounds amazing. So I'll be joining 
um, online. Uh, really exciting. Um, so this idea of, I actually went to the Health Ecologies Lab uh, site, not before it was relaunched, and um, was very excited by some of the language uh, used to discuss what's going on there. And this idea of collabor collaboration is what really comes to mind in terms of the things um, that we're talking about here and how this relates to listening and attention. And I'm going to return to collaboration again as um, a thread through these three projects um, that I'm going to discuss. So um, first, I want to talk about a project in which um, I was invited to create an alternative museum label um, for this object. Oh, we're not on. Oh, we are. Great. Um, so it's a four-inch square leather medicine kit uh, that reformer, innovator, and peace activist Jane Addams used when she traveled in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the kit lives in the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. Uh, that's it now, in just inside the front door, and is installed in Adams' bedroom, not far from her 1931 Nobel Peace Prize. She was the first American woman to win a Nobel Prize. And her FBI file also lives in that room, because at one point she was considered the most dangerous woman in America. Um, the alternative labeling project was created by then museum director, uh, the brilliant Lisa Lee, to question the short, didactic, tell the visitor what to think uh, museum label. So she asked, what if a poem were a museum label? What if a joke were a label? What if a muse musical composition were a label? So as curators, I, as many of my friends who are curators are, the, are some of the most amazing artists I know. And this project coming from Lisa to me was like she did half of it by handing me this idea of like, go, write a label. Um, so inspired by the settlement house Toynbee Hall in London, Hull House was founded in 1889 on Chicago's near west side. Jane Addams was deeply committed to collaboration in what she referred to as a mutual exchange. She saw an opportunity. On the one hand, there was this first generation of white women with college education, many of whom did not want to return home to their parents, as expected. And on the other, a neighborhood of recent immigrants who were subsisting under abhorrent and dangerous conditions. Addams was not interested in charity or philanthropy. She saw both groups as having needs. The newly educated women, and she was one of them, needed meaningful work and community. And the immigrants, mainly Italians and Greeks, needed safe living and working conditions. It was a mutual exchange, a meaningful collaboration. At its peak, Hull House consisted of 13 buildings and had a major impact on people's lives, as well as enacting legislative reforms at the city, state, and national level. I'd like to propose that we call Adams an early health ecologist. We can trace child labor laws, playgrounds, kindergarten classes, food and water safety, healthcare reform, immigration policy, all back to the Hull House. Here's the dining hall um, where they held these free themed community dinners. So like they'd have invite a bunch of Italian, it, open it up to the Italian community and folks would, community members would perform opera while eating spaghetti dinners. There were evenings of Greek tragedies, dancing, short lectures, presentations provided by both neighborhood community members and Hull House residents. And this is the same dining hall where visitors like W.E.B. Du Bois, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Ida B. Wells, and Upton Sinclair um, when he was writing The Jing Jungle, would come for meals and conversation. And there were free classes of all kinds, um, including art, uh, shoe cobbling, and on and on and on. So this very holistic idea about health and resilience and nourishment included art and celebration at its core. Adams and Hull House colleagues volunteered as on-call doctors, served as midwives, prepared the dead for burial, nursed the sick. There was also a deep respect 
for the knowledge of the community surrounding Hull House. And again, this idea of the mutual exchange. One Hull House resident, Alice Hamilton, a physician who was a pioneer in the field of industrial toxicology and a leading expert in occupational health, wrote in her autobiography, those Italian women knew what a baby needed far better than my Ann Arbor professors did. That level of respect ran throughout Hull House activities and documents, a mutual exchange. So for the alternative label, I researched Adams and Hull House and at first convinced myself I didn't need to know what was in those vials of pills and powder. I kept saying, yeah, no, no, it'll be more, it'll be a more interesting project. If I don't know what's in the kit, I really don't need to know what's in the kit. And then I realized I really needed to know what was in the kit. And so I, um, it, I was lucky because the Hull House is kind of overseen by UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, and they also happen to have an amazing school of forensic science there. So um, I asked uh, folks to um, help me. And so forensic scientists accompanied by a pharmacy professor specializing in antique medicine, he wore a tie with antique medicines on it when he showed up at the museum, which was really great. So they came to the museum and took samples um, I got to interview them and spend time in their lab, and they shared these amazing um, photos from their lab. They have this high-powered microscope where they can take images, and they cut these pills in half. They also shared their lab documentation with me with their descriptions. Um, I believe this they compared to a granite um, marble top counter, um, and this was like brown sugar, um, just beautiful kind of descriptions as well that ended up making their way uh, into my label for the museum and into the book as well. Um, so after some months, they figured out what was in the kit. The resulting label is a long prose poem in the form of a book that is part medical mystery, part meditation on peace and antagonism, medicine and poison, and domestic domesticity and justice. Jane Addams, um, has some of the most amazing writings that I really feel like we all should be reading right now, particularly on this idea of antagonism. Um, she really felt like antagonism, even at the level of the individual, was at the base of the cause of war. Um, and that was how deeply she took um, her peace activism. It's really, really inspiring. So um, the book is installed in Adam's bedrooms currently, um, where people can sit with a kit near them and read. When it was first installed, a visitor could sign up to be served tea from the Hull House China while they sat in Adam's bedroom with the kit and the book. So they, they call it a slow museum experience. So as opposed to fast food, slow food, slow museum experience. Um, and visitor feedback uh, from surveys was really powerful. So looking out for each other, a mutual exchange, doing and making together, as a way of being in community. During the fall 2016 election season and its aftermath, I was teaching a course at the School of the Art Institute, one that I've taught for nearly 20 years in different incarnations, um, a course called The Wandering Uterus, Journeys Through Gender, Race, and Medicine. I witnessed my students, so this is last fall, right? Fall 2016. I witness, witnessed my students, many of whom were people of color and are queer, and or non-citizens or and folks who had undocumented family become even more scared and disillusioned and devastated by this country's injustices and direction. We talked a lot, as I'm sure you all did at that time, and I asked them what they needed and what the school could provide. They said grounding, calm. They said we don't want to be talked at. We want to do and make things together. For me, this was really resonating with the Hull House because that's what it was all about. It was doing and making things in community. Um, we want to walk to the lake. We have a, a campus that's right on Lake Michigan, so the lake came up. We want face-to-face -face conversations, and we want to help others. So it was very much this thing of we want, we want help, and we want to help others. So last spring, I initiated the Radical Care Workshops 
a series of workshops for students, staff, and faculty inspired by those conversations. I began work with two wonderful graduate students, Yurima Elena Hernandez Perez and Israel Pate. We started with the idea that caring for others and caring for oneself are deeply intertwined and both are necessary for social justice work. The workshops continue. In a few weeks, Jess Young will return to lead her workshop, Roots for Resistance, Yoga, Self-Care, and Social Justice. And we plan another active listening workshop, another breathing workshop, and sound healing bath with Lama Lab Song Paldam Rinpoche. We had a baking and breaking bread workshop. We had Reclaiming Sexual Intimacy, a workshop for sexual trauma survivors hosted by rape victims advocates. And this coming Monday, we will have another bystander, bystander intervention 101 training led by the People's Response Team. Um, we had many walks by the lake and my favorite was led by my colleague Kamal Patton and was titled Acoustic Ecology Number no. Three. It was a mapped listening experience through Millennium Park with a playlist broadcast from the top floor of our school on a pirate station. We had a number of transistor radios and moved through the city as a kind of attentive, slow-moving swarm. So collaboration, listening, attention, and communities of care bring me to consider a third practice. Chicago Women's Health Center, or CWHC, is a 42-year-old organization focused on com compassionate health care and education for women and trans people, regardless of their ability to pay. Part of the women's health movement, CWHC came directly out of Jane, Chicago's underground abortion service, and still exists very much outside of mainstream medicine. This is um, a recent photo of some current staff wearing the t-shirt that I love. Um, long visits where people pay what they can, non-judgmental and respectful care, a collaborative team provider model attending to whole people, Clients are seen as knowledgeable partners in their care, and questions, dialogue, and advocacy are valued. We offer primary care, gynecology, alternative insemination. Notice the term alternative, not artificial. That's a whole, whole conversation. Counseling, outreach and education, and integrative health, which includes traditional Chinese medicine and massage. We have TGAP, which is the Trans Greater Access Project. And more, more than 6,000 clients are served by CWHC each year. This is um, our waiting room, which has this wonderful collection of posters from the Chicago Women's Graphics Collective when it closed in the 80s. They gave us a complete set of all these posters that they had actually done collaborative printmaking, where one person would create an element and then pass it along. Um, and they gave us this whole collection, which I love the fact that we have that in our waiting room. So working and volunteering at CWHC since 1991, so I've been there 27 years, has raised me and taught me about collective decision-making, about collaboration, about power, about what an exam can be and what health education can be. I thought I'd share three quotes from 2017 client surveys since clients often say it best. Every person I've met has been understanding, patient, and welcoming. I've struggled with insecurities my entire life, which often prevented me from getting health care. CWHC changed that. Much more personable and, and empowering, I was given responsibility during the appointment and my boundaries were very respected. I didn't feel like some farm animal during PAP. CWHC doesn't just care for me, they care about me. There are a few clinics like CWHC that come out of the 1960s and 70s radical clinic tradition that are still around and evolving. There's that word radical again, coming from the Latin word root, radical meaning forming the root. So I like to think of these as foundational rooted practices, not exceptional, or at least they shouldn't be. I know in my head I often think of radical as exceptional, but it's actually not. And that's the point. What can we learn? What do we need to learn from radical clinics like CWHC or like the Berkeley Free Clinic in California? This is one of the other clinics that um, has existed, started out of street medic care. So um, folks 
training themselves how to take care of people that were involved in protests and got hurt. And that's how it started. And um, this is a recent photo with their, uh, of volunteers, purely volunteer organization, um, and their um, mobile van unit, which a lot of kind of radical clinics, early clinics had this ability to travel and, and um, do things that they needed to do. Um, it's one of their kind of mottos. The folks involved in these clinics, and there were over 200 of them in the US in the early 70s, believed that healthcare is not a commodity, it is an exchange, that there are social and environmental causes of illness, that people have valuable knowledge about their bodies, and that community members can play key roles as peer health educators. That's really important, that medicine does not have to be the domain of medical professionals that a healthcare visit is a heightened space of ethical action where listening and attention is a priority. So in Chicago, starting in the late 60s, the Black Panther Party had their clinic. The Young, Lord, young Patriots, a group of poor whites from Appalachia, had their clinic. The Young Lords, a Puerto Rican political group, had theirs. Then there was another clinic associated with a group called Rising Up Angry, then Jane, which I mentioned earlier, which would become Emma Goldman Clinic, and then CWHC, all clinics with free or sliding scale services. Even though I've been at CWHC for 27 years, putting these qualities of practice into language is still challenging for me. I've started doing interviews with people involved in various radical clinics, particularly participants who came to these clinics as activists and then later became medical professionals. So Dr. Liz Feldman volunteered at CWHC as a medical resident in the 80s and is now a provider at Cook County Jail. And she told me in this interview that she keeps a mirror hidden in her exam room, even though mirrors are illegal, contraband in jail. She's not supposed to have a mirror. Just she keeps it there though because of her commitment um, from what she learned at the health center that she wanted to always be able to offer people a view of their cervix during an exam, if they have a cervix. Dr. Fred Strauss, who started the Gay Men's Health Collective at the Berkeley Free Clinic in the 1970s, told me he learned three things at the clinic that he did not learn in medical school. One, how to listen. Two, how to work in a collaborative team of providers. And three, how to admit when he didn't know something which I thought was really great. So through my work at CWHC, interviews, and other research, I'm hoping to be able to articulate what it is we need to learn from these radical clinics. It is clear that collaboration, listening, attention, a kind of peer-to-peer -peer mutual exchange, comprehensive holistic care, and respect are key. And so I'm looking forward to Rob's talk and then a great conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Now I'd like to invite Rob Piegler up to share a few words with us. And then just so you know, then we'll all, they'll all join uh, together up on the stage for some Q&A, so. Hello, everyone. I have to find my slides. Daniel, where are my slides? Oh, thank you. Um, hi, I don't want to keep us from uh, the group discussion, so I'm going to try to have a lean practitioner's conversation um, with all of you. Daniel emphasized that um, there's students here. He told me to take a look at what the curriculum is here and try to meet you with how you understand yourselves as artists and practitioners and um, stretch you into my bizarre world. Welcome. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to cover three projects, say what they are, what happened, um, mention if, what questions I have or what seems interesting to me about them, um, and then uh, I'm really interested to see what you all think. Um, 
I'm an independent consultant with um, co-conspirators, um, working on, uh, with clients in a consulting relationship and also uh, partnerships. So uh, first project, I worked with the Department of Public Health here in Philadelphia, the STD control unit, and um, some of the uh, issues, themes we were talking about, uh, engagement, audience, healthcare professionals, friend or foe, um, all uh, were active with this project. Um, a, uh, the head of the STD control program works for the CDC, but sits in the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. And she saw a presentation um, that CDC sponsored uh, where MICA, uh, Maryland Institute of Institute College of Art, uh, has a social design graduate program. And they worked with a local public health agency. And she was interested, um, Melinda, uh, here in Philadelphia. And there are things going on that are very impressive and very effective. Um, they're long-term, oh, I'm sorry. They're long-term projects uh, with the house and ball community, um, folks who vogue and dance and have collectives and support each other. There is, the CDC has a 1509 grant where they're looking at people as they're trying to not just look at people clinically and not just look at them um, as, you know, health operatives in population health, but to look at other determinants of health and give uh, wraparound support to people. Uh, that program has a think tank of unusual suspects who are doing some interesting work. But even with all of that, there's a set of people who the Department of Public Health knows that they don't know who they are and uh, don't know how to reach them. Uh, if somebody tests positive, they show up on the radar, but before that, the Department of Public Health doesn't believe that they're communicating with them or engaging them in existing information or programming that's out there. So the, the challenge in general is HIV and AIDS um, in men who have sex with men, men of color who have sex with men, and young men um, who have sex with men uh, is uh, the rates are bad, very bad. Um, and their goal is just to find out who, who's out there, how can we reach them, uh, how can we engage them. Uh, since I'm a practitioner, my, my definition is not a academic or textbook definition. It's not even a definition. It's just like, here is how I want to talk to my partners and clients about the work that I do um, so that we have the right attitude and focus and frame for what we're doing. Because um, there's um, social design, social innovation, social intervention design. There are a lot of emerging practices and names for things, and, and I'm not too concerned about getting the boundaries right there. But um, the way I approach work is collaborative, optimistic, believing that there are solutions or a better way for things to happen, um, building on homegrown solutions. It respects people, respects culture, and also just as a practitioner, it's pragmatic. If you're um, designing for social emergence, uh, designing for relationships and community, uh, relationships and trust take a long time to build, and you can't guarantee that it's ever actually going to happen. So if you can work with something that's already there, that's helpful. Um, Human-centered design, uh, designing in context, designing from the point of view of the people who have the problem you're trying to address. Um, is a well-developed practice, and there are methods, tools, and approaches uh, to draw on there. Um, there, as I like to say, um, kind of like industrial strength tools to help you cultivate empathy um, beyond what you can do as a mere mortal on your own. Um, and when, uh, one of the themes was uh, the big picture. Part of the big picture as I heard it, was uh, engaging people and oneself as whole people, 
um, but also just scale and complexity is another way to look at big picture. And there's a, a set of frameworks and methods and ways of thinking about and working with um, systems, comp I'll throw out some jargons, but systems, complex adaptive systems, um, just stuff that it's hard to get your head around and figure out where you can intervene so that you'll have uh, any effect. So that's the toolbox I bring uh, to my clients and the people I work with. Um, so I got a list of 10 people from the Department of Health and like Mission Impossible, they were like, okay, go make something happen. Um, and the three places I started focusing on were, there's always a kind of public health boogeyman. Um, and right now it's uh, dating apps. Um, in the 80s with uh, crack, crack was the thing that kind of changed how things work. And going all the way back uh, to the 1940s, before penicillin, um, public health and partner services and contact tracing um, wasn't a thing because there weren't um, effective, effective treatments. Um, and so back then, uh, public health was looking at um, prostitutes were their boogeyman, boogie people uh, at, at that point. Um, so uh, in order to understand what was going on with mobile apps, besides talking to professionals, talking to academics and reading, I bought a burner cell phone and got an account and rode around town on my bicycle because um, you need to, with geolocating dating apps, actually people need to be online and you need to be near them in order to see what's going on. So that was my summer two summers ago. Um, and I should say, I am a nerdy, introverted, middle-aged man and everyone I worked with, they were fierce and fiercely loving with each other and incredibly nice to me. I'm, I'm very dainty, I, I bruise easily. Um, so uh, there's the digital turf, there's home turf. One of the things I thought about was um, there are services and organizations in Center City that serve um, the people I was looking for, but the people who aren't showing up, they live somewhere, so, and there are community-based organizations in the neighborhoods they live in. Um, I wanted to find out, do those local organizations serve those folks? Do they know they serve those folks? Are they open to being more welcoming and serving those folks um, in existing programming and possibly developing new programming? Um, I worked for seven years with um, Jethro Heiko. You may have run across him. He was the lead organizer for Casino Free Philadelphia. And um, I picked up some, I don't know if I picked up any skills, I certainly picked up an ethos of community organizing. And I, um, I canvassed, I walked up and down the street in the Lancaster Corridor. I can thank uh, the Moore program for that. Uh, the in and out Symposium that was focused on ethics had a field trip and I should have known what was going on in Lancaster. I was a board member for um, the Hactory, which is at one end of Lancaster, but it turns out that the police, People's Emergency Center, CEC, there, there are a bunch of arts organizations and social service organizations that officially and unofficially and in an above board way and really uh, unstable and, and uncertain ways uh, collaborate to make things happen. So I thought that was a neighborhood where um, I might find some takers. Um, I'm already taking way too long, and I can talk to you about uh, finding a oasis of gender acceptance um, by surprise on that block, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Um, and then, um, in terms of kind of like adjacent turf or overlapping turf, for people who um, can go to center city organizations and are, can go there and are comfortable there, there were, organizations and uh, programming that existed. So I spent a lot of time with one organization uh, there. Um, one of the things that came up as I was doing my observations was uh, there seemed to be a kind of center and periphery 
gravitational thing going on. Uh, things got whiter and older as you come into Center City and browner and younger as you leave Center City. If you were comfortable in, with the house and ball scene, there are things for you to do. Um, if you were avoiding it, you'd stay out. Um, a lot of the people I was looking for were younger, so um, you know they're, they're not gonna go out on a school, a 12-year-old's not gonna go out on a school night um, and to a teenage drop-in in Center City if they, well, maybe at all, but definitely if they live in an outer neighborhood. Um, I did a lot of hanging out and talking to people, and what I was looking for was there, there are ways that the uh, public health apparatus isn't nice, but the public health system incentivizes people to take immediate and specific action that seems beneficial, like paying people to take a survey. Oh, wow. Um, I'm rambling on way too much. There existed a cultural infrastructure with people who organized things with the resources that already existed in this community, um, cultural formats um, that already existed, and uh, content that the Department of Public Health and people interested in care and community care would be interested in. And um, I looked at that and tried to figure out from a design, participatory design standpoint, how can those things be strengthened, um, expanded, who's reached by them, and, um, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, very quickly, uh, I mentioned Jethro Heiko. It's um, Georgia Guthrie, runs the Hactory I mentioned. It's an art maker space. Um, Nick Jalen, who's the lead designer for uh, my Gift of Grace, which is now called Hello, uh, and myself. Working with kind of the principles of nonviolence, which we tried to build into the way we work together, um, we built, you know, if you talk about care and empathy, what are the concrete things that you can build into tools and processes to support safety, empathy, uh, inviting people to exercise agency. Um, so uh, after a kind of business debacle, um, the company refocused, um, did some really basic R&D, and I just wanna throw it in here that I'm, I'm talking about design processes, but every myself, I have an MFA, and everybody I work with um, has very kind of a established art practices, and it's not something we separate out from what we do. Even with the most serious non-arty clients, uh, a lot of the methods we use bring people deeply into intuition and metaphor um, and poetry even. Um, so uh, we use some of those methods on ourselves, and uh, one of the directions we ended up looking at was end of life. Uh, we, looking at um, the, I want to, I want to wind this down really quickly. So um, I'll say about this that we took a any textbook human centered design process will accept people where they are. Um, try to understand people in context, interview, participant observation, that sort of thing. We tried to go as far as we could to, I don't know, really embody the nonviolent principles um, that we talked about. So for instance, we picked up from uh, hospital chaplains, there's a verbatim method where you, in order to, maintain eye contact, you don't take notes when you're talking to somebody, but you do have kind of like a framework of the points you wanna hit. Um, and then as soon as that's over, you go find a colleague and um, eye to eye, you recount verbatim what happened, um, and at least the way we learned it. And we did this ourselves when we were doing research. And we're talking to end of life care workers and families with people who are um, in, with late stage disease. Um, 
Jethro, my partner Jethro, would come back to me verbatim, recount what was going on. Jethro is an atheist, but still, at the end of this verbatim technique, you um, say a prayer for the person you talk to and yourself. And, th and that kind of, uh, I think, encapsulates all the different levels things work on. Just like the data is there for a design process, but um, supporting each other and making a connection is built into the process. My cartoon version of um, nonviolent strategy is you're very carefully designing how people come together, an intersubjective moment. Um, and that, at least from the way I've been approaching things with the people I work with, that needs to be built into the way you work in order to get it into the thing that you build. Um, and uh, that, um, that prayer is, you know, maybe that atheist prayer. Um, you might not see it as art, but it's, you know, it is not linear thinking. It is not an instrumental utterance. It's, it's you're somehow, um, you know, holistically and intuitively boiling things down. Um, I guess I also want to talk about Again, this may not have much to do with art, but it certainly has to do with community and, and social accountability. Uh, the process that I'm used to working with now, we, I and my partners, do participatory design where we do what would usually be in a design process, but kind of in parallel and interwoven the notion of um, kind of mobilizing and organizing is built in also. So uh, this game, we identified that there was a need, tried to understand who, might, who we might serve and what the context is. We came up with a game, and the idea was like, at Thanksgiving or some other family event, if there's a game that helps you easily have a conversation about not just death and dying, but what really matters to you in life. Like, um, Having values is one thing. Having them in a way that you can hold on to them and they can help you make decisions in a healthcare context is, is, is the expert class. Um, so we designed the game. We used a design uh, challenge to, as a foil to kind of focus us and build momentum. We had the people we were talking to to do research. Um, won an award, and then had lots of people kind of pulling us and saying like, okay, where's the game? And we we're like, it's just a prototype. We did a Kickstarter, which was um, excruciating, and I don't recommend doing one over the summer, um, and got $40, $45,000 to finish design and do a first um, print run. Um, somewhere in there, the, um, there's a research group at Penn State Hershey Medical Center that studies end-of-life communication and they had some conceptual frameworks that um, help you gauge the quality of a conversation. Um, and it also turned, it helped us sharpen the game a bit. And it also turns out that um, if you have that framework, you can also use it to train yourself to have better conversations. Um, I'll leave it there. The, um, the people on the other side of the, well, on the left side of the screen, there's a family, two generations of a family playtesting an early version of the game. Um, on the right side, there are people in Thailand. There are a group of monks who were doing uh, kind of end of life awareness and support work in Thailand, and they wanted to license the game. So um, we licensed that to them. I think um, the question of who owns the culture, who's a steward of the culture, whether it's a business or not, what's your sustainability model, are, are all really important things. Um, and even if you're an artist and you don't see yourself as a social engagement artist, there's still, you know, as you go out in con concentric circles of complexity and context, it, it helps to be, see where you're plugging in. Oh. Uh, um, the end.
is, uh, is my um, final project I'm going to mention. Uh, the End is a hybrid online-offline uh, game designed by Adrienne Mackey and um, her organization, Swim Pony. They, they're kind of a, a theater arts experimental organization. Um, this game you play over the course of 28 days. You're, it's active from 7 in the morning to 11.30 at night. Uh, a lot of it is played via text, some of it in Google Documents. There are some uh, live theatrical face-to-face -face, um, elements to it. And uh, I was a player and uh, enjoyed it a lot and found it um, the level of care that was built into the game um, allowed me to comfortably go places I might not have gone on my own. Um, the game came with a deck of cards and a journal. That's me holding up a card. I took a picture of myself every day, and one of the activities was to uh, make an altar in your home. And that's my altar on the side. And I think there's a question at some point about, um, you know, what would you like to leave for your legacy? And the first project I talked about, um, I drew a little diagram and sent it to them. It was one of the things that, like, I, I hope it reaches its uh, potential. Um, and I, um, Adrian hired me to do some qualitative data analysis for her and some strategy, strategy work. And I think maybe this is a nice example of um, art and being a technocrat. There's, there's a lot of data of people talking to the game. Oh, sorry, I need to wrap up. Um, finding poetry in the conversations and drawings and writing that people volunteered to the game is one of the really important things to do with the game. Um, but just figuring out how to fund the game and making sure it works as a technical um, product is also something that needs to be figured out. And the last thing I'll say about this is that um, it seems really important and figuring out, it seems like it could be a cultural institution and figuring out who owns it, who's the steward of it, how does it live, how do you scale it, do you scale it without killing it? Like these are all uh, questions that uh, I'm talking about with Adrian. Uh, thank you for um, taking that ride with me. Um, I look forward to the shared conversation. All right. Um, thank you, presenters. And uh, now I'd like to invite our presenters and um, Megan Voller up to the stage. And Megan's going to facilitate a, a wrap-up discussion um, with the speakers. So please, the, the three of you and Megan, please join. of you for absolutely lovely and thought-provoking presentations. Can, can you hear me out there? Uh, just thank you to our presenters um, for their wonderful and thought-provoking presentations. And we were able to touch base, uh, was it over the weekend? And so the questions that I'm going to ask you are uh, familiar at this uh, point, and obviously your, your work has um, addressed them over the years in various ways. So I'm going to start with that building audiences question. You know, I think there's not anyone who works in the arts who doesn't do a lot of soul searching around the question of who they engage through their practice and through their projects. And so I want to ask you about the thinking that you've done and the strategizing that you've done over the years as far as building audiences is concerned. And I use the word audiences liberally. Maybe it's students. Maybe it's community. Maybe it's users. Um, so please interpret audiences however you want. Uh, and maybe, Aaron, since uh, you spoke first, I'll pick on you first. Um, I was actually thinking about a conversation we had recently where you were talking about the context for these reading groups and kind of wanting to think even more experimentally about where these reading groups might take place and how they might make different kinds of impact in different places. 
Um, sure, so there's a bundle of questions there. Hopefully I'll, I'll do justice to all of them. Um, um, I was just, I was thinking, Terry, of your remark about Jane Addams being this kind of incipient and pioneering health ecologist, and she's actually at the core of like a new reading group we're developing for young adults um, and a kind of an after-school program, and oh, we've gone back to her writing um, with that. But um, yeah, so I've always approached kind of particularly as a curator um, kind of in public engagement in an incredibly intimate manner. Um, I'm really committed, and maybe that's because I also I'm an educator, I'm really committed to kind of that intimate dialogic interaction with others as really the basis for a relationship and the basis for like a transformative politics and project. Um, that said, like, so this week, as you know, I begin this like new work in Penn Medicine as a strategic advisor for health and humanities initiatives. And so that will like, that, that new role will really probably entail a totally different scale of activity um, that moves across health systems and, um, and maybe doesn't always begin with kind of individual um, but um, so I'm, I'm just at the beginning stages of like rethinking what is for me a very familiar and intimate kind of um, practice and project so. yeah. and slot feels that way mm -hmm. when you go to slot slot is cozy mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. sense and it, you know literally the conversations take place around small round tables or in little theater setups yeah, yeah so. and that's been like an intentional project over years to really like to redesign an otherwise austere and difficult space from the 1920s that was built as kind of a, a majestic bank mm -hmm. um, so that it feels incredibly personal and intimate and comfortable um, um, you know once you come through that that front door um, and that you that you feel like welcome in entering a conversation even if that conversation is otherwise kind of unfamiliar to you at a starting point. Terry, I'll admit, you kind of inspired this question for me, actually, because you work across very different communities and institutions. Mm -hmm. You work in the university, obviously you work in the arts, broadly construed, and then you also work for a women's health clinic. Mm -hmm. So I know you're working with very different communities and yeah. audiences. Yeah, and, and I mean, like Erin, the idea, for me, it's never been about huge audiences. It is really this intimacy. The, the, and one of the things that... So in nonprofit land, that kind of slow, sustained growth is so important, right? You know, I mean, part of the reason I think, there's a lot of reasons that these clinics that I mentioned don't exist anymore, but I think one of the reasons CWHC exists is it's been so ploddy, like mm -hmm. plodding along in terms of very slow, meaningful, intentional growth. Um, and so I'm really a fan on, of slow, of that slow growth and not thinking about vast audiences. That said, I just had this really strange experience last spring where I wrote a piece about um, teaching the wandering uterus class um, during the fall election season and teaching the yellow wallpaper. And it was published on this site called LitHub, which has this huge following. And suddenly I was having this weird viral moment, mm -hmm. which is not what I do and not what happens to me. And then I started getting emails from people all over the world who read this piece. And it's led to these really interesting conversations. So like last week I did this interview with this woman in Athens, Greece, who is at the head of this observatory for obstetric violence. And they're apparently, um, like nine or 10 of these observatories around the world. And I learned about this whole aspect of, of gender violence that I really didn't know much about. So, so in that sense, the kind of um, all of a sudden having this kind of big audience and then, and then how it's fed the work is, is really interesting too. So I do believe in that just kind of slow, intentional audience, but it is, as a, as a total Luddite and somebody who's not part of social media, all of a sudden it was really strange to have one of those moments where I was like, whoa, okay, what just happened? <laughs> you know? Part of what you talk about in that piece is how every, either sort of almost literally everyone's read the yellow wallpaper or heard or experienced right. something similar. Which I think is what caused that, right. and then, and, but it was a very long piece. And it astounded me that people actually put the time into reading it. So yeah. they say no one does that anymore. Right.
And Rob, yeah, what, well, I, you, already, you already have told us that you have driven around, or rode around town uh, so you could be geolocated on a dating app. That's definitely one way to engage people. It's going to be hard to top that. Well, the, um, to, how, to, how to engage people that um, struck me in two ways, yeah. to engage audiences. One is that, um, to be a little flip, I, I like it when I'm not trying to engage somebody, I'm trying to figure out how, how I can engage in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, pub, the public health project, there's a hidden ecology of culture um, that's going on. Instead of having great ideas and trying to get people to come to my culture, I want to nurture what folks are doing there. Yeah. Um, so that's one Yeah, absolutely. Answer. And what about for hello? Hello. Um, the, the intimacy notion and, and conversations also struck me. This game was originally designed in mind with um, a family or intimate group of friends uh, to play the game and have an intimate conversation. And, and there are structural things built into the game to help you negotiate the conversation and build trust without even being consciously aware of it. Um, so that works. Uh, those conversations on that level, but it turns out we, we found from researchers that given the way they evaluate conversations, uh, the quality and usefulness of a conversation in the game uh, is just as high as if you play it with strangers than if you play it with people you already know. Mm -hmm. And we've had public play events with 150, 200 people playing simultaneously, mm -hmm. and it's, it's simultaneously a mass group event, but you're at your own little table um, having an intimate uh, conversation. So that's one way to scale. And w one of the things I've uh, noticed from this um, kind of nonviolent strategy frame and from uh, my partners, the way they describe it is um, based on Gandhian nonviolence, we talk about designing meaningful actions, mm -hmm. actions that um, create that little bit of new world you want to see. You experience doing that. You experience your agency doing that. Um, Wow, what was I going to say about the game? Oh, the, this isn't what I was going to say, but the game, instead of giving people a form and telling them to fill out an um, advanced directive, the game actually gives you a direct experience of having a safe and enjoyable conversation yeah. about end of life and values. And can anyone go and get it online? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And figuring that out has been, uh, well, I left the company two years ago, but it's been an ongoing thing. The, Game has always been sold very cheaply online, like 20 bucks or less, uh, and individuals can buy it. But we've also, as a business thing and, and as a, a scaling thing, we've tried to figure out how, how do you breathe more resources into things. So we've engaged um, health systems and insurers to help them engage whole communities and also do kind of a cultural change in skill building uh, with their staff. And, and this, um, the logic of nonviolence is baked all the way in. Um, with other similar things, you might get certified or trained. Um, with this, a doctor or healthcare person needs to do something in order to be able to basically write a prescription for the game or give mm -hmm. the game to patients or families but it's not training, they have to play the game themselves. So it's, you know, a, a existential thing. I have played it, I can say whether it was easy or not, I can vouch for it one way or another. Um, and um, the game, uh, people are encouraged to play as themselves and leave their credentials at the door. So it's, a, it's another way to kind of cross boundaries, build things back yeah, to democracy. Equalize. Yeah, equalize. Yeah. Um, we just have a few minutes, is that right? So I, I'm just curious if the audience has any questions. So maybe one way we can do this uh, with limited amount of time is to collect a couple questions from the audience. Um, and, and if there's not any, then actually Megan has, a, has some good questions to wrap up. But um, any questions from the audience for our presenters? None. None of you have ever had an experience with art or health care. Remarkable. <laughs> You're a remarkable group of people. Okay. We want um, to hear from you. 
Megan, you? I think I see a hand. Was that just a beard scratch? That was a beard scratch. Megan, do you want to use one of one of your other questions as yeah, kind of a conclusion? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the the health professionals question. What do you think? Okay. Um, well, I, I was just curious, uh, based on all of your uh, practices and projects, um, what kind of relationships you have with health professionals. Are they collaborators for you? And the, the way I posed it intentionally, kind of provocatively, you know, are they allies? Are they adversaries? Are they foils? Are they the people sort of against whom your work shows up in a way? Um, and I realize that they may be all of those at different points for you uh, and or none of those. So it's just a, an open question. Um, that's, it's something that comes up a lot in the class that I mentioned that I teach, the Wandering Uterus Journeys Through Gender, Race, and Medicine. It's very easy for very quickly medical professionals to become the big bad wolf, the demon, the devil, very quickly. And um, so I think it's, it's very, it's so important to recognize the diversity and the variety of providers and how there are so many providers that themselves are so discouraged and, and, and dismayed with the state of affairs that they, that they are participating in. And, you know, just as though as citizens of the U.S., we might be incredibly dismayed and in despair about the fact that we are, US, you know, that that our government is doing some of the things it's doing. So um, I think that constantly trying to humanize physicians, also in the very history of the health center that I mentioned, which came out of Jane. Jane, if people don't know about the Chicago Underground Abortion Service, it's completely mm -hmm. fascinating. But basically, they provided um, abortions on a sliding scale using what they thought was a medical doctor who turned out to be somebody who wasn't a medical doctor at all. And instead of going, oh my God, it's not a medical provider, we have to get ourselves one, they were like, well, we've watched hundreds of these now, we know how to do it. And so they started doing them themselves. That group became the Emma Goldman Clinic and then in the Emma Goldman Clinic there was a schism where half of the group just saw it as a political hierarchical issue, we will not work with medical professionals. The other half said this is an access to care issue, in order to provide greater access to care we must work with medical professionals, we must collaborate and we think we can do that in a non-hierarchical way. That group became the Chicago Women's Health Center, mm -hmm. so very much in the kind of roots of where I come from is this idea that, yes, non-medical professionals have absolutely important and key roles in medicine, and they must, and we have research now all over the place of, of how important peer-to-peer -peer health education can be. There's also something to be said for collaborating with medical professionals, and politically this can be done in really progressive, um, beautiful ways. So. That's Aaron, how about for you? You're just about to transition into this. Yeah, new sure. Media. So, yeah, so I mean, the, you know, when you had um, thrown this question out to us a few days ago, you had also kind of linked it to like a larger question, which was about not just like how do we um, how do we construct our relationships to kind of let's say traditional healthcare mm -hmm. kind of partners and providers, but also um, you know. Um, how do we negotiate the fact that traditional healthcare settings have kind of um, reluctant, been incredibly reluctant to um, to really acknowledge legal and political and social mm -hmm. determinants Control. of health mm -hmm. and for, 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 for decades and that um, in so doing they've isolated the individual and turned the individual into somebody devoid of context mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know thoroughly marked by all sorts of structural violence that, that, mm -hmm. that are unacknowledged and unaddressed and so so maybe to like to, to kind of to answer that, I like Terry has just said, think that we have to approach this not in not necessarily in, in the language that we typically use in the arts and in kind of activist kind of spaces about kind of ally kind of you know, as ally or as, um, um, or as as foe, but rather we have to think of um, now more than ever like these new forms of solidarity that we can kind of construct and 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 really to like embrace the idea of partnership. And so what I've been trying to do is. Um, not think of it like how do you partner between the how do you construct a partnership or a solidarity between the provider, the clinician, let's say, 
and somebody situates them are, are different, but rather how do you bring all of these different voices together mm -hmm. that, again, just kind of, in a way, construct a different kind of conversation. So how do you bring somebody who is working in with regards to reentry and mass incarceration together with kind of somebody who's focused on Alzheimer's care and research mm -hmm. and, and, and an artist um, in that mix as well and an emergency f uh, care physician? And how do you bring, how do you complicate the, the binaries and the polarities that are so easily um, repeated within all of our work mm -hmm. um, if we're not if we're not vigilant um, and um, and this aligns with at slot like a new strategic plan that we that we started really with the election that also kind of in the case of the institution more generally like really um, um, compels us to construct new solidarity networks and new models of partnership um, the, the other thing I just wanted to throw out there is that this is like a really weird moment when uh, at least in in my nascent understanding um, of kind of the healthcare field and profession when there's like a really genuine interest in the arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if they know what the arts and humanities mean, or sure. at least it means something different than what we think it means. But but it's pretty remarkable that the, um, the, the consistent and repeated um, kind of valuation of what, for at least from an intuitive level, I think hasn't been valued for a long time, which yeah. is the work that probably many of us in the room do. So I think that's a conversation and opens up new possibilities for partnership in so many ways, but that still has to be invented. Um, uh, and that work still has to be begun, but I think this is like an incredibly exciting moment, despite all that's happening in our society, because there is finally this acknowledgement that I think the arts and humanities are like, desperately needed if we're to work through, again, the, the challenges that at least traditional health, the traditional healthcare providers are, 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 are realizing should have been addressed a long time ago. Yeah, I think you're right. I've encountered that firsthand. And I think it relates to something, Terry, that you touched on, which is that so many health professionals are deeply frustrated with the system. And I think some of the data that's been coming back about health professional depression and burnout suicide. and suicide, yeah. I think that's what's causing that change. Well, on that note, I want to thank you all for wonderful presentations. And thank you all for being here. Um, Daniel, thank you for having us. Patty, thank you for introducing us. And we hope to see you again at the next one. So we'll have you know time for you all to hang out and, and casually chat with any presenters if you like. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are some people in this room that have practices related to this kind of work too. So I hope you get a chance to exchange and share on that basis as well. So thank you for being here and uh, look forward to seeing you next time.